Hi. You kind of stole my opening monologue, but that's okay. I, I forgive you. So yeah, so uh, last spring I, uh, I had the great fortune and pleasure of attending DjangoCon Europe. And uh, it was my first DjangoCon in a while, I kind of dropped off the map. Um, I've been writing a lot of JavaScript as my day job for the last year and a half, and, uh, and not much Django at all. Um, the talks were fantastic, but here and there, I heard the sort of the sentiment of like, JavaScript, uh, right? Um, not so much in a, in, a, in a derogatory fashion, right? It wasn't something like, oh, JavaScript is stupid. No, nobody was saying that. But this attitude that JavaScript is, is painful, that it's complex, um, haha, JavaScript is hard, let's go shopping, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, and of course, hiding inside that sentiment is a deeper one, and one that I felt like I shared not too long ago. I, I love Python. It's comfortable, like warm, fuzzy slippers, so clean, so thoughtful. I'd brace myself like every time I had to dive into some JavaScript and hope that I didn't make too much of a mess along the way. Um, <clears throat> and then bit by bit, I was forced to become comfortable with it uh, and find the ways to make JavaScript feel like home. So my name is Idan, and I work on data at Heroku, mostly in JavaScript nowadays, even though the Python and Django community still feel like home to me. Like, you know, coming back here feels like visiting my family. Uh, I love you all. Uh, um, so uh, historically, most teams at Heroku are, are uh, it's a Ruby shop, largely. Um, so I convinced my team to meet me in the middle instead of like, you know, doing Ruby, I got to do some JavaScript, uh, okay. Um, so while my team isn't using a whole lot of Python, there actually is, by the way, an open position on a team that is explicitly a Python and Django gig, and they're super remote friendly, and they paid to send me here, so thank you, Heroku, and uh, if you'd like to work somewhere that does that kind of thing, then like, reach out to me later. So today I want to talk with you about modern JavaScript. Um, and by modern JavaScript, I mean JavaScript that's less messy, <laughs> less confusing, less intimidating, a kinder, friendlier JavaScript. Uh, when I first started working with JavaScript, it struck me how much cognitive overhead uh, it seemed like it added to my life. I longed for this feeling that I had when writing Python, this legibility, this practical beauty of the libraries and thought given to APIs, a culture of documentation, which I still really miss. Uh, JavaScript felt like a disjointed mess, right? I had all this visual noise cluttering up my text editor and distracting my eyes, um, and this unintuitively strange alternative to classical object-oriented inheritance. Uh, I missed syntactic sugar for common operations, like no list comprehensions. Uh, I found myself writing for loops like a caveman. Um, <laughs> and uh, of course, JavaScript's like, you know, infamous strength slash weakness, which is asynchrony. Uh, uh, and it lends itself to this like highly nested, hard to read callback style. So there's a lot of reasons why JavaScript feels uh, foreign and scary when you're coming from Python. And I haven't even touched on the, the cultural and ecosystem aspect yet. Um, and there's just no escaping the fact that every browser ships with a JavaScript interpreter, right? Outside of some very clever work from tall, unnamed, prolific, bearded Australian core developers with a PhD. There's <laughs> no way to run Python in a browser. Like, we call ourselves enlightened uh, 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 creators for the web, but how can we ignore the only runtime that ships with every browser? Um, like, we had this nice period of being able to largely ignore JavaScript outside of optional enhancements to making our forms look pretty. Um, but I think it's a mistake to treat JavaScript as something to be avoided or laughed at or otherwise scared of in 2016. So like it or not, JavaScript the language and JavaScript the environment is something we're stuck with, with all of the warts uh, that came from being designed in essentially 10 days. Uh, and all of the inertia that comes from having a huge install base of interpreters across browsers and servers and platforms. Let's leave us with two questions. First, how did we get to this current state of affairs, right? Not in a dry history sense, more uh, uh, understanding which pain points people care about, which will help put the solutions into context. And secondly, what's the current lay of the land? when it comes to JavaScript. At the end of this, if you aren't already familiar with the uh, current state of affairs in JavaScript, my hope is that um, 
you'll stop drawing dragons on that part of the map uh, and feel like you have a sense for what's happening over there today and where it's headed. Um, I'm not going to dive super deep on any projects. Uh, I'm not going to try and convince you that framework A is the one you should use and it's better than framework B. I'm not going to touch on how to integrate Django with front-end apps or anything in that direction. I will inject some of my own opinions and observations here and there based on my experience, but, um, but don't treat it as gospel. There's more than one way to JavaScript. Um, so let's dive in. Once upon a time, when the grass was still green and the air was still clean, we all uh, enhanced our forms with uh, fancy JavaScript validation errors and maybe made some stuff move around on the page. I think Andrew, what was, Andrew said something about snow falling during Christmas time. Um, there was one JavaScript, kind of. Uh, roughly the same limited set of APIs were supported here, there, and everywhere. And then in a bid to massively improve the performance of JavaScript, Google built and opened V8, uh, their JavaScript engine, for their super fast new browser, Chrome. Um, Node uh, is just V8 untethered to a browser with a standard library of stuff for doing things that don't usually happen in browsers, like file system access. Uh, and other kinds of IOE things. Um, so in a moment of inebriated glee, I considered titling this talk in a fashion that acknowledges the dual nature of JavaScript, but yeah, that's not a good idea. And it's, it's, even if I did, it'd still be a lie, because it's not even true that there's two JavaScripts, it's really like there's a dozen, because there's different JavaScript engines, right? Browser side, we've got you know, the four major browsers, and Node side, there's Node. Um, Packaging in browser land uh, is also something that differs between the browser side and the node side. Um, packaging in browser land used to be non-existent, uh, leaving you to figure out how to deliver your code to your clients. Tools like Bower came and went as a registry for downloading front-end JavaScript libraries like jQuery or Backbone, but they left the dirty work of like actually bundling them up and delivering them as static assets uh, entirely on our shoulders, like, you know, we had to figure out how to do that and put it in the right place and minify it and all this other stuff. Uh, on Node side, there's, there's NPM's registry. Uh, unlike PIP and PyPI, both the service and the CLI are named NPM. Uh, more on this in a bit. Uh, and finally, there's the matter of stitching modular code together. In JavaScript, the browser has no concept of modules. There is no such thing, just an HTML page which includes one or more script tags, and those scripts can include more scripts, so you can have scriptception. Each tag can have uh, its way with the global namespace. Literally, any script that you include can do whatever it wants. Um, there's no isolation whatsoever, and people wrote uh, a kind of client-side module system, actually a few of them, to make this process a little more formalized, but it always felt a little bit like a grafted-on solution. I'm talking about require.js. Node has a very basic module system, so you can modularize your code and import files into each other, but that's about it. Um, and outside of the language itself, there isn't really much in common between browser JavaScript and server JavaScript. The language part that both browsers and Node had in common for a long, long time was ECMAScript version 5. ECMA is the European Computer Manufacturers Association, I think, whatever, it's a standards body. Uh, and uh, JavaScript uh, is officially ECMAScript uh, as far as the standards process is called. So for a long, long time, ECMAScript version 5 uh, was the one that reigned supreme. Uh, uh, it was published in 2009. Uh, so you can think of it as kind of the equivalent of Python 2. It's well supported, all the different browser engines and all the different backend engines, that, that they all support ECMAScript 5 um, pretty much uh, uh, the same and fairly well. Um, <clears throat> and nobody wanted to do anything about this for a long time because any changes would have to be made in like 15 different engines, and that's painful. But eventually, the desire to improve the language uh, won out over inertia. Uh, and the standards bodies kicked off version 6 of ECMAScript. It added a small amount uh, of new features and a huge amount of syntactic sugar. Um, and this version alone is responsible for many of the things that make JavaScript uh, a much friendlier place to write code today. This full list is huge, so suffice it to say that this represented an even more dramatic upgrade to the language than Python 3 was for Python. Uh, this was finalized in 2015, so six years went by between uh, ECMAScript 5 and ECMAScript 6. 
Uh, unlike Python 3, ES6 was entirely additive, breaking nothing about older JavaScript. You could opt to use the new bells and whistles, but existing ES5 compatible JavaScript will continue to work in any engine that does ES6 as well. Uh, and thankfully, it wasn't like a one shot and now we're gone for six years again. The Sanders body was like, you know what? Six years was way too long for us to take between versions. Um, uh, we're going to do an annual release cycle. Um, <clears throat> ES6 officially became known as ES2015 when it was ratified. Uh, ES7 became ES2016. Um, ES8 is the proverbial ES next. It's the one that's coming up next always. Um, and the standards process looks like this. Um, there's different stages. You make proposals. This is the equivalent to the PEP process from Python or DEPS from Django. Um, it's fairly transparent. Happens largely on GitHub. You can see all the features that are in flight at this GitHub URL. Uh, everything starts at stage zero, and as it proceeds to stage four, anything that's in stage four when the year ends is part of the next version of JavaScript. This is the compatibility table. <laughs> My apologies if you're colorblind. How many people in the room are red-green colorblind? I'm sorry, there was nothing I could do for you. It's like, this isn't my table, I didn't build it, it's not my image, so uh, you'll have to take my word for it. Can I, can I like mouse with my thing? Will it, like, can I see my mouse? No, I can't. Oh well, I should have thought to get a laser pointer. Too late for that. Uh, so there's this, here we go, I can do this. There's this big green stripe right here. This represents late model browsers, right? Like late model Firefox, late model Chrome, uh, where is IE Edge? This is Edge right here. Um, Okay, so this is like the safe space for uh, uh, ES6, right? The thing that was released in 2015. And then over here, this green stripe is late model node, late model server-side JavaScript. ES6 is fairly well supported. Almost everything in these columns are green or very green or mostly green or just some flavor of green. Um, anything that is not in those columns uh, ends up being a very mixed bag. <clears throat> So you can actually use all of this cool stuff. It's well supported all over the place. Uh, like it's not this bleeding edge thing that you need to be scared of. You can actually go ahead and do stuff with it. Um, if your targets include older browsers, then well, like you're shit out of luck. There's nothing that I can do about that part. Maybe. The picture is even less rosy for like the newer stuff, ES 2016 and 2017. It's still very much like a work in progress. It takes time for all the vendors to implement the stuff, but it gets better. And now that there's a, a release process that happens annually, everybody's sort of trying to, to, to hew to, to that schedule and try to like catch up to it. This is a good thing. This is exerting like downward pressure on all of the browser vendors. Fortunately, there's a project called Babel, which is a modular compiler or technically a transpiler. I don't know if that's actually a word or if that's something the internet made up, but it targets ES5 and it has support for all of ES2016. Uh, so you can optionally turn on transforms for each of the ES stages. Remember I said there's stage zero, one, two, three, four. You can actually turn on and be like, I would like all the features that are currently stage two. Uh, and Babel will take those features and it will compile it down to a version of JavaScript that everybody, everybody, everybody can run. Um, uh, and if this sounds scary, remember that most of JavaScript's new features basically amount to syntactic sugar. Um, and the ones that aren't can be simulated in all kinds of different ways. Um, and it's pretty cool. You can actually read the output. It's not, it's not perfect. It looks a little bit like unobfuscated or unminified code when you, when you read the output of Babel. But it's not completely opaque. You can actually read the code and understand what it does. So um, it's not that bad. So on the web, there's this, there's this term polyfill, uh, to using like a bit of JavaScript to retrofit new functionality onto browsers that lack them. Um, but this approach, Babel kind of flips the model on its head. Um, as time marches on and more and more of these uh, uh, combati compatibility tables turn green, you can switch off the parts of Babel that you don't need. Basically, uh, you're compiling future JavaScript into current JavaScript. Um, Babel isn't the only one in this category. Um, Google also released a transpiler called, uh, I'm probably going to say this wrong, Tresser, Tres, Trekker, I'm not sure. Uh, seems French. Uh, there's a Babel for CSS called PostCSS. So this sort of model is spreading to other places, like you know, tomorrow's X today. Um, so this isn't about transforming another language into JavaScript, like CoffeeScript or uh, Google's Dart or Elm. It's really just about future JavaScript 
and getting it right now. Um, so I like to call these poly features. Uh, if the internet made up polyfills, then I made up poly features, and I figure that's probably valid. Either way, uh, Babel is rock solid. Uh, I've been using it in production for the last couple of years. Um, and I get to use all of the cool shiny toys worry-free. Um, even the stage zero transforms are fine to use, right? They're also fairly solid, with the caveat that if you're going to build on stage zero features or stage one, the earlier stage features, that those features might change out from underneath you at some point and you'll have to rewrite some of your code to accommodate those changes. But the actual transforms that Babel ships are actually fairly stable. It isn't like, oh, it doesn't really work all the time. It works fine for the current version of what this idea looks like. This also kind of renders the question of JavaScript engines moot, because the output from Babel is ES5, which everybody, everybody speaks. So um, let's talk a little bit about JavaScript, the syntax, all these cool features that I keep alluding to. Um, what are they? What is it that makes uh, modern JavaScript feel nice and fun and um, easy to code in? So modules, right? Uh, anybody who's ever required a module in JavaScript that looks like, you know, require? Uh, new Shiny, uh, reminds you of any other languages? <laughs> looks an awful lot like Python. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's still path-based in JavaScript. Like, there isn't this layer of indirection of Python path with, like, the dotted path name thing. No, it's actually you need to supply a valid path, and you can do things like, you know, um, dot, dot, slash to go up a directory and things like that. But at the end of the day, the engine is looking for things like, you know, if I ask it for libmath, it's going to try and find a file called math.js inside a folder called lib that is relative to where I'm currently in terms of execution. Um, there's one catch. You can't use import statements anywhere except the top of your file. Uh, if you need to conditionally import something, you still have to use require. Uh, this is actually, I just like, opened up some random file from, from a project and like, ripped out the, the header blocks. This is what it looks like in practice, and it doesn't actually look that bad. Um, it doesn't, like, I don't feel like I, my eyes are bleeding just from reading this code, so um, it's okay. Server side, all of your installed packages are still directly accessible by name. So the stuff that's in the first block are things that I installed and have globally available to my project. Destructuring works a little bit differently compared to Python. Um, for arrays, you won't get any errors if there's a mismatch in the length. Um, so pay attention to that. Uh, it'll just give you undefined uh, for things that are missing. Um, or it'll attach the relevant ones like this A equals 1, B equals 3 thing, and it'll literally skip over if you give it an extra comma. Um, but there's a cool thing, you can destructure objects. Basically, you can think of it like dictionary destructuring, which Python doesn't have. Um, so uh, I wish Python had it. This is actually a pretty cool feature. I like this. Um, default arguments, something that we take for granted until you don't have them anymore, and then you're very sad. Um, so now, JavaScript has this as well. Template strings in JavaScript bring cleaner string construction. Uh, it's still relatively, like, there isn't the whole string formatting thing, um, uh, particularly like Python 2.7 and up um, is pretty nice. Here it's literally just you can put whatever expression you want inside this dollar curly parens. Um, it also lets you do multi-line strings, so this backtick string format for interpolated strings uh, is like triple quotes in Python. Uh, you can actually do this across, across lines. Um, inheritance. Who here feels like they really understand prototypal inheritance? <laughs> you want to come on stage and explain it? <laughs> Prototypal inheritance is like a really strange animal, uh, especially when you're coming from a, a lifetime of object-oriented classical OO design. You write uh, a function that talks about this and doesn't seem to return anything. And then you set some properties on the function, and then you invoke it all with this magical new keyword. Um, this is way confusing, and uh, I still, every time I like run into something, I'm like, oh wait, does it work that way? And I run for the docs, and then I feel stupid, and I don't like having that experience. So um, this is actually the exact equivalent of the previous slide, with a little less magic, but it's still the old sort of approach. Um, but I find like this makes a lot more sense to me uh, in terms of what the prototype is. Here, car is the prototype, and my car, 
you know, if you think of passing arguments to a constructor, it's just setting that, that property on top of things. And it explicitly points at its prototype with a magic under, under proto. Um, and then uh, when you invoke a method on that object, if it's not on that object, it'll walk up the prototype chain to find the first one that has a method like that. And that's prototypal inheritance in a nutshell. Um, so great, that's nice, but new JavaScript has this uh, sugary syntax for classes. Uh, and this is exactly the same thing again. Um, and it works exactly how you expect. And the syntax is a lot easier to read. Um, so no longer do you need to suffer with this whole prototype thing. Uh, but under the hood, it still functions exactly the same. We could be here until tomorrow covering a long list of cool stuff in ES 2015 and forward, but suffice it to say that from a strict language perspective, it's a whole different ballgame. It's really actually quite nice. Um, uh, it's somewhat irritating that some of the things don't have the same names as like the ones in Python, for example, like these convenience things like includes and entries and whatever they don't. So when I go back to Python or I actually write some Python once in a while, I get tripped up because I use the wrong method names. Um, so yeah, that kind of sucks, but it's still nice, it's convenient. Uh, however, there are a bunch of features that aren't just syntactic sugar. Um, arrow functions are one of the big ones. So uh, who here knows what this means in JavaScript? Also, a few people that might want to join me on stage. So there's five rules for this, but uh, it boils down to who is, is asking for this? What's, what's doing the invoking? This is very much a function of where it's being invoked. Um, so uh, one of the easiest bugs to write in JavaScript is thinking that this, this is the same this as the surrounding code that you see on the screen, which is not true. Um, it might not be, depending on who's doing the, call, the calling, and, and that's, that's a really shitty experience. So um, <clears throat> this matters a lot with callbacks. Uh, and there's a lot of callbacks, therefore it matters a lot in JavaScript. Uh, because the invoker isn't under your control. Okay, here we have uh, two code blocks, right? Uh, set timeout is gonna uh, 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 invoke this uh, say name callback, right? Um, uh, 100 milliseconds later, right? Any guesses as to what each will say? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the, the core dev section here a collective, a collective like thumbs up for correctly inferring what this actually uh, prints. The top one will print undefined because it's not the same this as the this that's around the this. Um, and if you think that that, that statement is, is messy, it's, it's like that's JavaScript. Um, so, uh, but the bottom one uh, <clears throat> with arrow functions, it, it supports a lexical this, meaning the code that you see on your screen right around it, the, the context that it had at the moment that you use the arrow function, that's the one that's captured and used for the arrow function. Uh, so this is a huge upgrade to your ability to understand the code that you're reading on the screen. If you see an arrow function, you know that the this that's inside it is the same this that's outside it. So this is like a huge upgrade, but it's not just uh, uh, for you know, the, the sort of this legibility things. It's also nice purely because it's briefer. I don't need to use the function keyword. And in many cases, I don't even need to use uh, uh, the return keyword. And uh, technically, I could do away with the parens as well. Um, so long as you have an expression on the right side, uh, you don't need to even say that it's returning something. It's just whatever is the value of that expression is the implied return value. So um, this is way useful in a lot of places, namely uh, anywhere you would think of using a lambda. Um, you want just a short little like piece of code. This is a great way to express that with the terseness and brevity of a lambda. Um, uh, and it has some very particular applications in asynchrony. Um, ES 2015 brings some like legit changes to make asynchrony less painful. Um, so this is the style idiomatic of JavaScript, right? Uh, this whole callback style. And if you look at Node standard library, it's full of, of these kinds of of, of functions. If I've got something uh, asynchronous, I need to pass it uh, some callback, and when it's done doing the asynchronous thing, it'll invoke that callback by convention. First, with uh, the, the callback's signature needs to be error, then result. 
Um, so when it's done doing its thing, it'll if it's successful, it'll call back, it'll invoke the callback with null and the result. And if there's an error, then it'll invoke it with the error and null. And then you're stuck with this weird idiom where when you need to handle this thing, you need to write this if error, then handle the error. Otherwise, do the thing that you want to do, and you have to do this over like 19 levels of nesting. Uh, so very rapidly, it starts being illegible. Uh, and the fact that JavaScript mostly uses two spaces for indentation doesn't make up for this. Um, this sucks for readability. So enter promises. Uh, promises are great. At their most basic level, a promise is something to which you can attach as many callbacks as you like. Already, this is more legible than the whole if, error, then pattern. Um, but the real power of promises is that you can keep attaching callbacks, as many as you like. Uh, if you want to centralize your error handling, no problem. Wrap your async work in a promise and hand that promise to your global error handler. Um, so like, that'll work just fine. And behind the scenes, promises are kind of a, a tamper-proof state machine. Right? Promises are born unresolved. You don't yet know if they represent success or they represent failure. Uh, promises which represent a success are called fulfilled, and the ones that are failures are rejected. Um, either way, once a promise is fulfilled or rejected, it's considered resolved, and it's locked into that state forever. You can't like walk back from a resolved promise. Once a promise is resolved, that's it. Um, so returning to our earlier example, at the moment that we're doing this catch, we don't need to know if the promise is, is, is resolved. It'll execute when the promise rejects, or it'll execute immediately if the promise already rejected. So you don't need to think as hard about like what's going to be the state at the moment in time when this code is going to be running, and do I need to add more stuff to wait for the result? So yeah, that's the promise part of promises. Promises to call the thens upon fulfillment and the catches upon rejection. Doesn't matter where they are. Doesn't matter when you attach them. Um, so that's pretty nice. But that's not the only cool stuff you can do with promises. You can also chain them together. So each then can return a promise of its own. But there's a shortcut where if you return just a plain value from, uh, uh, from a then, uh, then it's like returning a fulfilled promise. And if you throw an exception inside of then, then it's like a rejected promise. So the following then is executed immediately with the output of the previous then. Uh, and in fact, if all you're doing is calling some function that takes the result as a sole argument, then you don't even need much of the setup, you can just give it the function name. If you have some functions you wrote somewhere else, and they take a value and they return a value, you can just give that to the then. You don't need to write another function there to handle it. So extra brevity. But what happens if an error gets thrown in one of these thens, right? Each one of these thens represents effectively another promise. Well, then it'll skip right over all of the subsequent thens and find the first catch it can find, and that's the one that it's going to invoke. Um, Make sure to put a catch at the end of any of your promise chains, because if not, you will be silently swallowing errors. I've discovered this in production. That was not fun. Um, uh, but otherwise, this construct is, makes it much, much easier to think about all of the asynchronous things that are going on, and how do I make a chain of them, and do I need to think about when they're ready? So OK, so it's great, uh, and the code does read better. Um, uh, but we're still responsible for creating and using these promise chains. Uh, just like in async IO, there's also async await coming down. I think it's currently stage four, which means in theory next year we should have it in JavaScript proper. Um, none of the browser engines uh, support it well, except for I think like the Firefox nightlies or something like that. Um, this is another form of syntactic trigger that leverages promises. Any function that you mark async must return a promise. Uh, and you can await anything that returns a promise. But instead of setting up a chain of handlers, you can use try catch like you did in the good old synchronous days. Um, you can only use await inside async functions. But when you do, your code looks almost linear. You don't need to think about the asynchrony. So this is actually pretty nice. So the core language itself is a lot better. But a lot of what makes JavaScript a nicer environment today compared to years past is the strides made on the tooling front. Uh, I've managed to get like 60 slides in before mentioning the elephant in the room, which is the dizzying variety of tooling and rate at which the tooling turns over. 
Uh, in the last year, there have been a number of funny, haha, but not really funny blog posts. JavaScript fatigue was one of them. Uh, how it feels to learn JavaScript in 2016 was a number, another. Um, both are, are worthwhile reads. Uh, and there's some truth couched in the satire. It, it, it does suck that this is changing so rapidly. Um, the crux of it is that the rate of change is mind-blowing, right? Week to week, the list of what you should be using changes. Uh, and the best practices from a few months ago are, are scorned as out of date. Um, this is certainly my least favorite aspect of JavaScript, but it's important to put it into perspective. Um, this is a younger, less mature community, but they're so excited that they're producing a prolific amount of code. And this is not something that we should say like, oh, that's terrible. This is nothing that we should say like, oh, that's amazing. Um, all these people are pouring their heart and soul into something that it's making it go so fast that like the wheels are coming off of the bus. So uh, yesterday, Andrew said that it takes a lot of tries to get a good API. Um, I think that we have front row seats to that process with JavaScript. A lot of the stuff that's going on now are like refinements and you know, patching all these weird edge cases in the language to make it a less hostile environment. Um, none of that means that you must be constantly using the latest and greatest. Um, Hacker News mentioning some project does not create a moral imperative for you to go and download and use that piece of software. Uh, wait. Let it bake for a little first. Uh, like you, won't, you don't need to be playing with the latest and greatest the day that it's released. Uh, and particularly in production contexts, uh, every time you need to do NPM upgrades and, and, and updating your stuff uh, can be painful. But you know what? You don't need to do it every day. Otherwise, you're going to spend every day on the upgrade treadmill. So schedule them a week apart. Schedule them a month apart. That's actually the solution that we settled on in our team. We literally have one day marked on every month. That's the NPM upgrade day. Uh, <laughs> and it takes pretty much that long to actually go through the process of upgrading all the packages and finding all the things that aren't supposed to be broken, but are. Um, so um, yeah. Um, this explosion is largely expressed right in this huge amount of packages on NPM. Some of these packages are tiny doing uh, one thing in like a handful of lines of code. Um, JavaScript embraces extreme modularity as kind of a core value, which is a, a little weird to me, but OK, you know, like different strokes for different folks. Uh, it's taking the Unix philosophy to its logical extreme. And once I sort of thought of it that way, I said, oh, OK, I can sort of see where that's coming from. Uh, it has its upsides, uh, but the critique is that now you need to stitch together like 15 things in order to do the most basic task. Um, and uh, not, not to, to hate on Flask at all, but it feels in some ways a little bit like Flask versus Django, right? When I look at Flask, the first thing I need to do is install like three or four things to, to get Flask to do the stuff that, you know, Django's battery included sort of philosophy already took care of for me. Um, so yeah, less batteries included and more like look at our humongous battery store. Um, um, Ostensibly, all of this is made possible by semantic versioning, which is universally followed in the Node community. This is actually a point for them. They settled on this as like the scheme. Everybody uses it. Um, uh, it's pretty nice. Major version bumps indicate breaking changes. Minor and patch do not, uh, in theory. <laughs> in theory, this should make dependency upgrades easy, right? You know, if you avoid major version bumps, everything should continue to work. But it doesn't. I've been burned over and over again by minor version bumps breaking things. Uh, and this is because developers are human. Uh, we make changes to our code, and we can't always foresee exactly what those changes will affect. Uh, and the people on the other end of the wire are you know, just like me. So uh, I understand why it happens, but uh, uh, so far, the only strategy that I've found is, is simply to do it less often, and then I will spend less time fixing it. Like I can skip over a couple of point releases and nothing, nothing is bad. Unless they have security issues and then I unfortunately have to pay that tax over and over again. Um, and there's the downsides of modular everything. Last March uh, there was a developer who rage quit the ecosystem and deleted all of his packages from NPM um, because of a legal tussle with a corporation. Uh, and among them was an, I, I kid you not, an 11 line module whose sole function in life was to left pad strings. Everybody heard about the left pad debacle? Yes. This is, this is it. 
like these 11 lines broke the internet. Um, uh, the problem was that a bunch of popular projects had listed it as a dependency, maybe not even an explicit dependency, or like popular projects depended on something that depended on something that depended on something that eventually depended on left pant. Um, and so when this developer got into this like completely unrelated legal tussle over a different package uh, with a uh, corporation, NPM, the uh, corporation that administers the repository, uh, ruled in favor of the corporation. And when I say ruled, it's not quite clear what process happened there. Uh, and the developer just unpublished their code uh, as a matter of principle, including these 11 lines, and it broke everything for everyone. Uh, this case study is worth reading as a cautionary tale. Uh, without getting into who was right and who was wrong, there are a lot of ways in which the story like, could have been averted at a lot of different stages uh, in this discussion. Uh, and faced with breaking the internet, um, uh, Laurie Voss, uh, who was chair, I don't know if he still is, uh, uh, of the NPM board or organization, company, whatever, uh, they un-unpublished the package in question uh, without bumping the version number, and they handed the keys to a different developer. Um, if this is not already making you feel like, oh, very scared and uneasy on security grounds alone, um, then it should. Um, it's scary. What if they handed it to a developer who was malicious? Did they vet this other developer? What if I've spent some time vetting the original developer and now all of a sudden you know, I've had the rug pulled out from under me? Um, they didn't bump the version number. They didn't do any of those things. So that's kind of scary. Um, and I don't know what to say about that kind of thing except um, thank God that we have Donald Stuffed. And, um, uh, uh, because I... I can't speak for him to say you know, what he would have uh, done or just generally the Python packaging people that are involved in it. Um, but I'm extremely, extremely grateful for having that as something that I can trust and rely on. Um, uh, and uh, it's hard, thankless work that you only really think about when it breaks. Uh, by contrast, I need to give props to NPM the client, uh, like the pip equivalent, for a fundamental choice that I do love. Um, you uh, have to explicitly ask it to install packages globally. Like the default is it installs them locally as if into a virtual env. In fact, it doesn't even have this whole like virtual env thing because Node is file system based. It literally installs it into the current directory, like wherever you are when you execute the command. Um, uh, this is a great default. I don't know if we could ever pull this off in Python, but uh, this is a great default. Um, but otherwise, NPM has a number of other warts. It's slow. Uh, it's really slow. Uh, every time I try to download stuff from NPM, and like the caching story there was totally busted, it can be non-deterministic, meaning that two people installing from the same package.json, which is like requirements.txt, uh, might end up with uh, the same dependencies, but a slightly different on-disk layout. Um, in theory, this should be OK. Um, but it can be the source of some very mystifying bugs uh, like that work for me but don't work for somebody else. Um, so that's terrible. Um, a collection of engineers from Facebook decided to actually fix this problem. Uh, and like a couple of weeks ago, they just released an alternative uh, NPM client uh, that you can think of as sort of the pip to NPM's easy install. Um, uh, called Yarn, and it solves this and a number of other user experience deficiencies. It pins package versions by default. Normally, when you install things with NPM, it installs it with a default semantic versioning identifier that says, like, uh, don't bump the major version number. But uh, as I've previously said, I don't trust even minor version number changes or really patches either. So, um, so I like to pin the exact dependency number uh, uh, version. Uh, Yarn does this by default, unless you actually go out of the way to like type extra flags to say, no, I want something different. Uh, and it's fast. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can say, OK, how, how much do I care about it being fast? You know, how often do I really NPM install on my local machine? That's not what fast is useful for. Fast is really useful for your CI. Like every time your CI build needs to download all of these packages, uh, Yarn being like five times as fast as NPM means that you get to skip over a lot of time and waiting. So once you've gotten all of your dependencies installed, you still need to write your code. And that code should be beautiful. And it should look the same as everybody else's code. 
right? We have uh, PEP8 in, uh, in Python, right? And we probably have something in JavaScript, right? No. There's no PEP8 in JavaScript land. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't, there isn't one standard. Like many other things in JavaScript, there's like the XKCD version of standards, where it's like now I have like 17 standards or whatever. Um, but there is a decent linter uh, called ESLint. Uh, it has a lot of plugins, a lot of rule sets. Uh, it's on you to choose which rule sets you want to use. You can use the Airbnb style guide, or you can use that style guide, or whatever style guide. Um, uh, pick one and use it. Um, me, personally, uh, I found one called uh, StandardJS, which is fairly uh, a popular. I like it mostly because it has zero options. Um, like, it's literally like Pep8 in the sense of, this is what it is. You don't have any say, like, you know, in theory, I could write a piece of software that will format stuff this way. Um, uh, so StandardJS feels a lot like Pep8 to me. Uh, and it has one other feature that I like very, very much, in that it outlaws the semicolon. Um, <laughs> relying on JavaScript's automatic semicolon insertion. Who here knows that JavaScript will insert semicolons for you if you don't do it yourself? Awesome. Who here knows what the rules are for that? <laughs> it sounds scary, but it isn't. Um, like those ads you see on the internet, there's one weird trick. And if you know it, then it just works. And the rule is, never start a line with any of these three characters. So long as you don't start a line with any of these three characters, you never need to use a semicolon in JavaScript, ever. Um, and this is particularly important if you're hopping back and forth between writing Python and writing JavaScript, because um, if you're uh, writing semicolons into your Python, you're going to discover rapidly that it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, that's a thing. Um, but regardless, linters are a great thing if you're writing JavaScript. Pick one, set your editor up to use it so it complains at you. Set up like your git pre-commit hooks so that it complains at you. Set up your CI so it complains at you. Um, consistency is a lovely, lovely thing. And there's no reason that you should give that up just because you're writing in a different language. Um, <clears throat> On the spectrum of strong versus loose typing, uh, JavaScript is its own animal. Coupled with the fact that exception handling is relatively limited in JavaScript, like there is, you can't catch a specific error. You, like you, I can't say like, I want to catch only like this kind of error. Nope, you can just catch an error and then deal with it. Uh, and you have a recipe for breeding a lot of bugs. Um, there are two projects that graft static type checking onto JavaScript. Uh, both are popular, and both catch uh, common type safety errors, like, hey, uh, this could be null, and you're not handling that case, uh, just letting you know. Um, uh, but at compile time uh, versus getting this error when it's already in production, uh, which is, is terrible. So there's uh, flow, which is from Facebook flow type. Um, uh, it's pretty nice. It's the one that I've looked at the most. I haven't put either one of these into production yet. Uh, so all of this is sort of my speculative opinion. Um, it's easier to gradually add flow annotations to your code base. And it's compatible with uh, the Babel tool chain. Uh, like it can literally be one of the transforms in your Babel compilation. Um, <clears throat> the other is TypeScript. It's very popular also. It was released by Microsoft. Um, it's used by a lot of libraries. Uh, Immutable.js is one. I've seen it all over the place. Anytime you find a file inside a project that ends in .d, .ts, that means that somebody has exposed the TypeScript definitions for this library, and that's very helpful. It can also auto-generate documentation for you, uh, which is pretty nice. Um, but uh, it has some functional overlap with Babel. Uh, the TypeScript engine can do some, I'm not quite sure exactly what degree, of ES2015 transpilation uh, for you. But it means that you can't have that in the same tool chain as Babel. So in the war of Babel versus TypeScript, I choose Babel and then Flow. Uh, but a lot of people choose TypeScript. And particularly if you're working on a library, a lot of people choose TypeScript for libraries, because then like, you don't need to integrate with this build system that does whatever. Everybody loves a good REPL, right? Node ships with one. Uh, and Babel ships a wrapper that translates your statements on the fly, so you can write like more modern JavaScript into your REPL. Um, it works pretty much the way that you would expect it to do to work. Um, uh, not much fancy there. 
But if you miss IPython Notebook slash Jupyter, whatever it's being called nowadays, um, there's a service called RunKit. Uh, it's like a hosted IPython Notebook, Jupyter, whatever, uh, that, uh, that has some extra fanciness, that has access to all of the packages on NPM. So you can just require whatever, like there's no installation necessary. Um, this is a highly useful sandbox. Is this like, oh, cool. It's actually doing what it's supposed to do. OK. Let's talk frameworks. The highest compliment that I can pay React is that it tastes a lot like Django. Um, I've been using it for the past two years. Um, like We built out data.heroku.com with it. It's very undogmatic. Uh, a lot of attention given to backwards compatibility, both in terms of actually caring about not breaking things and documenting what the process is for backwards and compatibility changes. Um, when you look at the release notes of React releases, they smell and taste an awful lot like Django's release notes. I find this comforting, like a warm security blanket. Um, but uh, most critically, it sports the clearest mental model I've ever seen for uh, front-end development. Uh, you have React components, they receive state, and then they render themselves according to that state. So state in, whatever that state should be rendered at comes out. Um, there's more than one way to do that, but uh, by and large, that's what React does. Ember. Uh, I like Ember less for fairly plain reasons. Uh, uh, Heroku's dashboard is an Ember app. Uh, Ember is incredibly popular, um, particularly for uh, uh, JavaScript developers that are coming over from the Rails world. Um, it has a lot of the same uh, uh, sort of principles and ethos, the convention over configuration thing. Um, uh, and they have a vision that's super clear to them, uh, and they're executing on it. Uh, they're constantly incorporating good ideas as they come up. Uh, this is made for a little bit of a bumpy road. If you actually use Ember and have used it for the past, I don't know, year and a half, two years, then every once in a while they're like, hey, this is a pretty good idea. We should do that too. And then they write a whole like, new version of Ember that breaks half of what was there beforehand, and uh, everybody is forced to upgrade their code. Uh, so it can be bumpy. But if you're coming from Rails, it has a lot of the same mental models as Rails. Like Rails people look at this and they're like, oh, I get it. Here's my controller. Here's my thing. Here's my that. I looked at it and I was just like, why does this file have the same name as that? Does that mean that that's why this file knows about this file? Like, I just didn't understand. It's all convention. Um, but convention seemed very magical to me. I can't really speak to Angular very much because I haven't done very much with it. There's actually two versions here, version one and version two. Uh, version two is really, really different. Like, you know, if, if uh, we talked about Python 2 and 3 earlier, like, uh, if anybody has ever done the Python 3 thing worse than Python has, it's Angular. Uh, they broke literally everything in Python 2. Uh, no, you're saying no? Or you're saying yes? Yes, okay, excellent. Um, wholly, wholly incompatible with version 1. And it's led to this schism where like, a bunch of developers are really you know, annoyed that they just wrote a whole code base in something that's deprecated. Um, so yeah, it makes me feel kind of good about how we handled Python 2 versus Python 3. There's lots more. Uh, Reactive.js and Vue.js, Elm, Polymer. Polymer is Google's thing that wraps standard like vanilla web components, which is like a, a, a standard, uh, and was ostensibly going to be the future. But then React and Ember and all these things sort of came along and lapped, lapped these things. Um, vanilla web components are still nice, but they're not quite ready for prime time in a lot of browsers. So Polymer is Google's way of shipping web components with the polyfills necessary to make it work everywhere. Um, they also released a bunch of their material design stuff together with Polymer, making it easy to sort of in a, um, a bootstrappy way, like build things that look fairly attractive fairly quickly. Um, uh, and I'm sure there's like 19 other ones that I haven't heard of because I'm just not that much of a cool kid anymore. But uh, uh, they exist, they're out there, and they're constantly showing up. But the, the, the big ones are the ones that I, I, I think we've sort of touched on them all. OK, so now you have this mountain of tooling that's enabling you to write your software. You have uh, some tools to let you write code from the future. And you have some tools to enforce consistent styles. And you have some tools that validate that your code uh, does what you think it does. 
And of course, this is the web, so you have some more tooling that's not JavaScript related, stuff for processing your CSS and your markup, and hopefully you have some tooling for tests. Uh, modularity invites a wealth of tooling, uh, but then you actually need to run all of that tooling all the time. Uh, and you don't want to type like 15 commands to like run this tool, then that tool, then that tool, then that tool. So uh, you want a better way to like orchestrate your three ring circus. For a while, there was a succession of modular task runners that were the de facto way to stitch all of this tooling together, like run your development server and bundle everything up when it's time to deploy to production. Uh, Grunt was the first one, and it spawned this whole ecosystem of tasks. Uh, tasks for compiling, tasks for minifying, tasks for copying, tasks for whatever. Uh, and Gulp came a little bit later, and it had a slightly different mental model. Uh, sources, filters, and sinks. Sources were most often your files. Filters were anything that processed your files, and sinks is where they wrote the files out to. Sometimes they would write multiple things together into one file, for example, for concatenation. Um, so, but it was, it was sort of like breaking up tasks into like more functional components. Um, these two are still around, and they're still somewhat popular, uh, but they are being displaced by uh, Webpack, which is the newer kit on the block, although not so new anymore. Version 2 is about to be released. Um, and it's rapidly becoming the dominant tool, particularly in the React community, but not just. Um, it knows how to work both with code and other static assets, uh, images, everything, CSS. Um, and it makes it easy to set up all kinds of things that you want, like hashed file names for easy cache busting, with far future expires headers. It knows how to traverse your files and figure out which ones are importing other ones. And if you actually go to the Webpack like, page and see, like, they think their old logo used to be like a network of files with like the connections between them. Uh, literally, that's what Webpack knows about. Um, the upcoming Webpack 2 even knows how to do something pretty cool, which is called tree shaking, by which uh, it discards code that you're not using or assets that you're not using and actually excludes them from the bundle that you're shipping for production. Like It shakes the tree, and anything that's not firmly attached to your tree falls off. Um, hence, tree shaking. Um, uh, it also supports bundle splitting, which is another uh, great performance tool. Uh, you can say, OK, here's the parts of my code that involve my libraries, things that don't change very often, uh, and I'd like to cache them for a longer time. And here's the part that includes my logic that I'm going to be shipping every day. Uh, and I don't need to invalidate the first bundle every time I do a deploy. Um, so Webpack makes it easy for you to sort of split your code into pieces and deliver them as a couple of different files so that you can better leverage browsers' caches. So all of these are great, um, but uh, it's this last feature that is maybe the number one reason why I love front-end development today more than ever before, and that is hot module replacement. Um, I cannot, I could, this is literally the largest like type that would fit onto this slide. Uh, uh, if you set it up correctly, Webpack plus hot module replacement enables this magical, you're going to have to imagine the Johnny Ive voice because I can't do that, uh, a magical front-end development experience. This isn't live reloading. This isn't like I make some changes and then my browser automatically knows that it should refresh. Um, that was a step forward, uh, but this is something way better. This is literally swapping out your running code for new code while it's running. Um, so say you're working on something that needs to be in a particular state. Uh, for example, form validation. Reloading blows that state away, right? You know, every time you make a change to that, you reload the page, and then you have to go do whatever you did to get the form into the state where you could see the thing that you're working on. Um, having to retrace your steps and recreate that state is a huge speed bump. Uh, I can't overstate how much I love this. I'm willing to pay almost any price to have it. I don't believe I will ever go back to working without it. Um, and that's good because configuring Webpack can be a real pain, um, but still totally worth it. This went a lot faster than I thought it would. Uh, two years ago, when I struck out on this road to sort of level up my JavaScript, I felt very lost. I knew that jQuery was over there, and D3 was over here, and people were building more and more ambitious things with JavaScript. Everything felt foreign. To some degree, it still does. Uh, but there's a lot in JavaScript land where my first reaction is still uh, to scratch my head. Uh, but there's a difference between feeling 
uh, foreign and feeling both foreign and lost. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> there are entire areas of JavaScript, areas of JavaScript that I haven't even discussed. Uh, advancements in client-side APIs, things that enable us to build ever more refined web apps that don't feel like web apps. Uh, Adrian, wherever he is in the room, is super excited about surface workers. Um, there's a ton being done to enable high-performance animations uh, and things that sort of bring the native mobile feel to the web. Uh, native apps have blazed this trail that sets expectations, but I still believe that the web is powerful like a river. Year by year, it nibbles away at the things that stop it from greatness. Uh, and hopefully, you no longer feel that JavaScript is something to be avoided or laughed at, but another place for you to level up your making, your maker foo. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we've got about three minutes left on your talk slot, so oh. it took longer than oh, that's... you felt it did. Okay, so here, it's, see, it says 13.57. I was just like, it's been only 13 minutes? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to be very picky about the questions, but there's a whole load of questions for you to go back and look at. Um, you said earlier about the pace of change in the JavaScript community and everything moving really, really fast. Have you got any recommendations about how to keep up with that? Are there good conferences to go to? Are there good blogs to read? Uh, there are. Um, I'm going to say uh, Reddit. I know that that might not be the most popular thing to say, but, but Reddit's, like, like our JavaScript, is actually a fairly good source of news uh, for things that are going on in the JavaScript community. I also subscribe to our React, uh, which has a lot of like, React-specific news. Um, uh, there's podcasts, there's a ton of conferences, there's JSConf and JSConf4U, there's ReactConf, there's EnverConf, there's a million conferences to go to. Uh, I haven't been to any of them, so I can't tell you which of them are the good ones to go to. Um, I will say very positively that a trend that I've observed in JavaScript conference land is that they also taste more and more like Python and Django conferences, particularly as relating to anything involving uh, code of conduct and making everyone feel welcome. And I feel like that's a prerequisite for me being willing to stick my toe in that pool. So I'm happy about that, but I, I don't have specific conferences to recommend. You said about Jang, the, the massive battery shop. Um, is there an idea that, can you imagine JavaScript starting to have more batteries, starting to have more of a standard library as we get to, you know, ES, not, you know, whatever or something? Yes, and um, maybe, my guess is that I, I, I don't think, I, look, I can't speak on their behalf. Uh, I'm not part of core anything in JavaScript. Uh, but uh, my guess is that the answer will be no. Because as just a basic ethos, the ethos uh, is very much one of like, no, go download it somewhere else, like NPM. Um, so I don't think they're going to include more and more uh, things that are not just like language features. Um, but I do think that we're starting to see sort of the pendulum starting to swing the other way. If previously it was moving only towards uh, a divergence, more and more packages trying the same problem from different angles. Now we're starting to see a little bit of consolidation. Uh, you know, everybody's settling on this one as the one to do this, and this one is the one to do that. So that's a positive move because it makes it easier for you to find the one that's good. Uh, and ha finally, how do ASMJS or WebAssembly fit into the big picture of JavaScript going forwards? Uh, have you all seen uh, uh, Gary Bernhardt's The Birth and Death of JavaScript? <laughs> if you haven't, you should watch that, because I feel like that's probably the best answer to that question. It's, it's interesting in the sense that uh, ASMJS is a way to annotate your JavaScript in a fashion that permits the uh, JavaScript, like the, the JIT, to efficiently JIT your code to the point where it's almost native um, in terms of speed of execution. So you can write things like games or I don't know, anything else that's going to uh, need something a little bit more powerful than the standard JavaScript interpreter. Um, ASMJS is a way to maybe future write native applications in JavaScript, but it's not quite there yet. There's some motion on this. I see a lot of talk about WebAssembly, but I feel like it's, it's not yet important enough for me to like actually spend time learning it. Let me put it that way. Thank you very much, Adan. Thank you.